Stadiums are among the most iconic, eye-catching structures of the modern world. Symbols of local and national pride, cauldrons of passion, where legends of sport compete, and where stars of entertainment draw massive crowds. No other type of structure keeps so many people so close together and in such an emotionally charged atmosphere. So when disaster strikes, the effect can be catastrophic. The fire spread faster than a man can run. And disasters have struck again and again. Some people are killed not by their fall, but by people falling on top of them. Turning public spectacles into national tragedies. I felt in fear of my life. I thought I was going to die. Today, ambitious new stadiums are rising up on every continent. The engineers behind them are striving to prevent the disasters of the future by learning from what went wrong in the past. If ever any disaster happens, then we need to learn from it. In short, every new stadium under construction is being built from disaster. When disaster strikes at a stadium, the tragedy is played out in the full gaze of public horror. And during the past century, more than 1,600 people have lost their lives in stadiums across the world. 1902, a terracing collapse in Glasgow, Scotland, left 26 dead. 1985, Heysel Stadium in Belgium, a riot by hooligans led to 39 deaths. In the same year, a stand in Bradford, England, went up in flames, claiming 56 lives. And in 1989, 96 soccer fans were crushed to death at the Hillsborough Stadium in England. But from these tragedies, engineers have learned there are three main dangers their structures must be designed to prevent. Structural collapse, fire and crowd crushes. New stadiums are determined to solve these problems through a mixture of pioneering technology, strategic planning and radical design. All of these can be seen at the state-of-the-art mega stadium currently being built in Valencia, southern Spain. The city soccer team is abandoning its old home, the Mestalla, because it's just not up to 21st century standards and has no room left to expand. The new Mestalla, on the outskirts of the city, will offer unrivaled views for 20,000 more fans, a capacity of 75,000. And uniquely, the city's geography has actually shaped the eye-catching exterior. Mapped onto the roof is Valencia's River Churia, now our client here in Valencia has said they want the world's best stadium. Antes que nada, tiene que ser un estadio donde se juegue bien al fútbol y donde el Valencia gane casi todos o todos los partidos. The corners are already marked out. And builders are working day and night to complete the job in record-breaking time. No stadium of this size has ever been built so quickly. But neither the tight deadline nor the beauty of the design is the most important mission for the new Mestalla's engineers. Their ultimate responsibility is to make sure the fans who'll soon be flocking here can do so without fear for their safety. Because when disaster strikes, people who come to watch a game find themselves fighting for their lives. May the 11th, 1985. 11,000 people were packed into Valley Parade, the stadium of English soccer team Bradford City. Just before half time, some fans in the main stand noticed a problem. I was sitting with my father in law. He said to me, It was hot underneath the seat. I lowered my hand, and indeed, it, it was. 
We saw a little bit of smoke uh, coming up. The immediate suspicion were, were hooligans were uh, setting fire to paper. At that point, the police motioned to us to go to the back of the stand. Less than a minute later, a whole block of seats was ablaze and the match was halted. People started jumping up out of the seats rather smartish-like and there was the panic, first bit of panic started. We got up, we walked along a few seats to the gap in the back wall, which took you onto a walkway. The smoke got pretty thick. That back walkway got very congested. And then the smoke came down, the thick black smoke, which as it, it was as if someone had turned the lights out. You could hear people screaming, shouting. I got down on my hands and knees because it was so thick. I actually crawled over someone, whether they were alive or not, I don't know. The toxic smoke was now poisoning the trapped crowd, and with each second, the flames were coming closer. By this time, I was getting to a stage of panic, and um, then it was as if someone had switched the lights on, and I looked back to where the light was coming from, and it was the fireball was coming along the corridor. The stand's roof was now on fire. It's described by an onlooker as the fire spreading along the stand faster than a man can run. Those of us who were up there could just about walk, so that for many of us, the fire has spread above us, be below us, and beyond us. As soon as I saw the fireball, I stood up and started to run. I thought, this is it, you've got to do something. And it is true what they say, your life flashes before you. Both Peter and Paul made a desperate dash back through the burning stands, down to the pitch. That the temperature rose as high as 900 degrees, which I understand is something like the heat in a crematorium. Even on the pitch, it was hot enough for some people's clothes to spontaneously combust. The whole period from that first flame to the entire stand being on fire top to bottom took a fraction over four minutes. If you weren't out before that four minutes, you were never getting out. Fifty-six people died. Immediately afterwards, investigators began to search for the causes of the disaster. They had two big questions. Why had so many people failed to escape the burning stand? But first of all, how had the fire taken hold so quickly? One factor was obvious. The 80-year-old stand was built mostly from wood. Forensic analysis showed a cigarette or match had fallen through a gap in the floorboards. In the space underneath, litter had been allowed to build up. Old newspapers and food wrappers were easy to ignite and the fire could build invisibly before anyone knew of its existence. In the immediate aftermath of the Bradford fire, wooden stands across the UK were condemned and demolished. Nearly half the clubs in the English Football League had to close some of their stadiums. And since Bradford, any new stadium has to make sure every single material is fireproof or protected. Jay Parrish, one of the designers of the new Valencia Arena, has been creating stadiums for over 30 years. What went wrong at Bradford has shaped everything he's built since. If ever any disaster happens, then we need to learn from it. We've got to find out why did it happen, and more importantly, what do we have to do for the stadiums we're designing now to make sure that we don't make the same mistake. Building a stadium from wood is one mistake that of course won't be repeated in the 21st century. At the new Valencia Stadium, like all other modern examples, the key building material is the most fireproof known to man, reinforced concrete. 
but to give this design iconic appeal, the team wants to clad the whole exterior in steel. And that creates a challenge because steel melts when it reaches a high enough temperature. So the project's fire engineer has to find a way of stopping the metal collapsing if fire breaks out. There are a lot of different methods you can use to protect steel. One of the methods is boarding it up with a fire-resistant boarding. That's cheap and ugly, and it doesn't go with the image of the stadium. So what we've opted for here is an intermittent paint, which to the public, you wouldn't know that it's protective. A simple demonstration shows what this amazing flame retardant technology can do. On the right-hand side is untreated wood. In the middle, it's been painted with normal paint, which burns even faster than bare wood. But on the left-hand panel, the intumescent paint behaves differently. It expands into a layer of charcoal. Less than a millimeter's layer of paint swells to 20 times its thickness. This stops heat being conducted and stops oxygen feeding the flames. After six minutes, both the other samples are burned through and the conventional paint is releasing toxic fumes. After 45 minutes, it's total destruction for the untreated material. But the intumescent paint not only keeps the wood from burning, it's still cool enough to touch on the back. Valencia's steel work will be protected by intumescent paint for up to two hours at its most vulnerable points. But as well as the steel and the concrete, the stadium needs a material for its roof. And choosing the wrong one could have fatal consequences. One of the main causes of death at Bradford came from above the fleeing crowd. A wooden framework had been coated with something even more combustible. Bitumen. It caught fire with horrifying speed, released toxic fumes, and dripped burning tar onto people's heads. As well as something fireproof, the Valencia design calls for a material that's lightweight and stylish. The architect's choice sounds dangerously flammable. It's a kind of plastic polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE for short. But Jay Parrish and the Arab team have used a similar plastic before to cover the whole of this stadium in Munich. Locals call the Alliance Arena the rubber dinghy. Shared by two different teams, the whole thing changes color according to which is playing. This chameleon skin is made of airfill bubbles of ETFE, a close relative of the plastic planned for Valencia's roof. When the material was first proposed, the Munich Fire Department responded with a long list of safety rules that the plastic would break. So the engineers had to set up an elaborate series of tests to prove that their plastic wouldn't be dangerous if fire broke out. There's a bit of a misconception about, uh, about the concept of an ETFE roof. It's almost like cling film. If anyone's ever used cling film to, uh, to put over, over bowls of food, if you ever put a match underneath, it, underneath a piece of stretched cling film, what happens to it is it punches a hole straight through the cling film and the cling film melts away from the ignition source. Exactly the same thing happens with ETFE in a roof. As soon as it gets hot enough in the middle, and it actually it's about 200 degrees Celsius, and the ETFE will melt and shrink away from the ignition source. And it will continue doing so as the fire builds. The roof material vaporizes, giving the fire nothing to feed on, so it can't take hold as it did at Bradford. The plastic had passed its test. And when it opened in 2006, the Munich Arena was rated one of the best stadiums in the world for fire safety. It's an achievement Valencia's new stadium is determined to equal. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything, from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. 
But the absence of fireproof materials wasn't the only reason so many people died at Bradford. Nearly all of the 56 who perished had been trapped in the burning stand. Why couldn't they escape? 4,000 fans had tried to get out at once, but whichever direction they fled, they found obstacles in their way. To reach the most obvious place of safety, the pitch, those in the seats had to jump down one wall and climb over another. Hundreds of other people instead tried to get out the way they'd come in. They knew that beyond the corridor at the back of the stand lay the safety of the street. But they found that doors and turnstiles had been locked to stop people without tickets coming in. Only at the end furthest from the fire was there a single open exit. Of the 56 people who died, the largest number died in that top corridor, near the turnstiles or near the gates that were not open. Stadiums built after Bradford have to make sure the crowd can evacuate before the fire becomes a danger to them. So although Valencia aims to pull in huge crowds, as important to its design is the speed they can get out. At full capacity, the stadium would have 73,500 people in it. We've designed the evacuation system to get that full population out within seven and a half minutes. The 48,000 people in the middle and upper tiers will be served by over 150 exit staircases and ramps. The rest can exit at any point around the stadium, straight into a wide concrete concourse. All then get out to the street from any of 24 exterior stairs. The key thing is to maintain a fluid flow and get people out, out of the stadium quickly. The challenge for engineers is to make precise predictions about evacuation time while dealing with unpredictable human beings. So crowd behaviour from real situations like Bradford has been studied intensely and has now been fed into computer simulations. These can help fire engineers test their evacuation plans. We're now in a position where we can use predictive tools to assess what kind of uh, incidents could occur in the future. The first aspect that we consider is means of escape, which is extremely important for stadiums, obviously, because of the number of people that we have around there. Probably the most densely populated buildings in the world, um, and all these people have to get out. It may seem incredible that a machine could ever predict the behaviour of real people. But this software is so sophisticated, it actually gives individual members of the crowd different personalities. What we always do is make sure that the people that we're modelling includes people who've got reduced ambulance, people who might be a little bit older, people with children. What you see uh, in, in this particular situation is people that are unhappy with their particular, uh, their particular position in the queue. Generally, eight minutes is the bar that we won't exceed uh, because people start to get a little bit agitated and not really to like to queue more than eight minutes. Of course, the longer it takes people to get out, the bigger a fire will become and the greater the danger. So the engineers have to predict not only how people will behave, but also how the flames and smoke will behave. This is a recent project, which is actually modeling a concert scenario. So we, we've, we've modeled a, a very large fire on a stage, and we have a, we have a domed roof over the top, which is containing all, all the smoke inside the stadium. And everything inside that layer is, is, is basically deadly. The highest person in this bowl is sat just up at this point here. So what we have to ensure is that these people have got enough time to evacuate before conditions in the bowl become dangerous for them. The interaction between crowd and structure is at the very heart of stadium design and of stadium disasters. It's what makes stadiums unique. They're not just concrete and steel, they're also flesh and blood. No other type of structure packs so many people so close together for such an extended period of time. But when individuals turn into a crowd, unstoppable forces can be unleashed. So above all else, stadium design has to manage the dynamics and dangers of crowds. It's a lesson that was learned the hard way at the first major stadium disaster of the modern era. When it opened in 1900, the Ibrox Park Stadium for Glasgow Rangers 
was the largest purpose-built football stadium in the world, with a capacity of 80,000. Two years later, the ground was packed out for an international match between Scotland and England. Suddenly, something gives way on the terracing, and people fall there, describe it later, like through a trapdoor. And they don't just fall down, down, down onto the ground. They've banged their heads, one guy is hanging by his foot. Some people fall down onto the concrete below and are killed not by their fall, but by people falling on top of them. 26 people died. More than 500 were injured. The terraces that shattered were built from wood, supported by steel. But the engineer seemed to have made some mistakes in his calculations. What he had not properly factored in was the live load, the people it had to carry. And the timber beams were stressed not just by the weight of those people, but by the force of that crowd's movement. Shortly before the stand broke, there had been a surge of fans straining to get a better view of the Scottish team. For most large structures, human activity is actually insignificant. Much more important when designing a bridge or a skyscraper is the dead load, the weight of the building materials. The biggest task is making sure the structure can support its own weight. But Ibrox made it clear that stadiums face unique engineering challenges, which is why a few years later, the designers of London's new Wembley Stadium tested their live load calculations by inviting a crowd of human guinea pigs along before the opening. Over the decades, engineers have become increasingly knowledgeable about how materials and designs will withstand live loads. But collapses have occurred more recently. In 1991, 17 people died and 2,000 were injured when a temporary stand in Corsica collapsed. Just like at Ibrox, the stand simply didn't have enough supporting cross joists for the number of people it was expected to carry. And in 2007, a three-metre hole opened up in an upper terrace of a concrete stadium in Salvador, Brazil. Soccer fans plunged 15 metres to the street below. Eight of them died. These beams are destined to hold up the middle seating tier of this stunning new sports stadium being built in Valencia, southern Spain. But although this reinforced concrete can easily cope with a load of 800 kilograms per square meter, a crowd weighing a lot less could still threaten its structural stability. When you look at them, you think, well, how on earth could you get something that's as big as that and as massive as that to, to actually move at all? You know, if I, if I jump up and down on it, it doesn't really do a lot. But the top tier of this stand in Nuremberg, Germany, clearly is moving, and alarmingly. It's because the crowd is jumping in rhythm, bouncing at the exact rate per second that triggers the reinforced concrete structure to vibrate as well. Every element of the building has its own natural frequency. If you, if you hit it hard enough, it will oscillate at that frequency, a little bit like a string on a guitar, for instance. The problem affects an overhanging balcony, cantilevered seating tiers. The lack of any supporting pillars underneath makes it more sensitive to crowd movement. In 2000, the vibration problem was noticed at a major European stadium. Next tonight, the fears about safety, which have closed part of Liverpool's Anfield ground. The movement caused by excited Celtic fans jumping up and down in the recently extended upper tier led to urgent safety checks. As Anfield underwent emergency building works, engineers were beginning to realise that longer cantilevers were particularly at risk. So the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, which opened around the same time, had reason to be worried. It features some of the longest cantilevered stands in the world, up to 14 metres unsupported. What really caused the engineers sleepless nights is that it regularly hosts huge concerts. And music is more likely to get people moving in rhythm. Experts fear dancing could lead to disaster, even though the vibrations couldn't cause the stand to collapse. 
And as people jump up and down, so that stand will start to bounce. Now, structurally, it's very sound. It's stable, it's not gonna fall down. But the 15,000 people who are actually on the stand as it bounces up and down don't know that. And the concern is, of course, they may well panic, they may rush to an entrance, there'll be trips and falls, and that's where the injuries will occur. So any disaster would be caused by fear of a collapse rather than a complete structural failure. A crowd could never jump forcefully enough to actually break a modern stand, but for the people underneath, it would still look like the roof is falling in. So to reassure them, uh, what you do is you put these props down and actually it stops the building from moving. So it reduces the amount of flex in the floor and therefore the people are reassured. The Millennium Stadium was fitted with 54 of these hydraulic dampers. Kept tucked away during sporting events, they're brought out when the arena switches to concert mode. It takes about five days, three-man crew, so it's a very laboured intensive job. It's an effective but low-tech solution. To avoid this time-consuming work, the team have decided that not all musicians require extra structural support. People like Rod Stewart, uh, the Eagles, I mean, they're quite sedate bands, quiet. People tend to listen to the music and not move around. Now, look at Oasis, U2, Coldplay, different kettle of fish. I mean, that's a really active crowd. And as well as being hard work to put up, the columns block the view from some seats. The new Valencia Stadium doesn't want these problems with pillars, so the designers have returned to cantilevered balconies. Their solution to the risk of vibration is to strengthen the structure at key points. What we do is actually model how it will react to people jumping up and down. And that gives us a more efficient design because it allow, allows us to place stiffness exactly where it's required in the structure. But building structures strong enough to bear the load of a crowd is only part of the engineer's challenge. They also have to design structures that will manage and control crowds, because above all, the crowd needs protection from itself. What's being built here today is a lot of leading edge engineering. It may seem pretty complex, but actually it's not the biggest challenge for us. The biggest challenge is how do we deal with all the people, and in particular, the behavior of crowds. The most dramatic and visible challenge posed by a crowd is when a small minority deliberately causes trouble. Hooliganism has in fact rarely led directly to deaths in sports stadiums. But there was one terrible occasion when it did. May the 29th, 1985. Italian team Juventus were playing England's Liverpool in the European Soccer Cup final at the Heysel Stadium in Belgium. Among the supporters of both clubs were gangs of hooligans. Throughout the day, these gangs had been fighting with each other and the police. Shortly before the match was due to start, a group of Liverpool hooligans charged into a Juventus area of the ground. Italian fans beat a retreat in panic. But they ended up trapped in a lethal crush. Some desperately started to clamber over a high wall. But the wall collapsed under the pressure. In the crush and the chaos, a total of 39 people were killed. Politicians and police were determined to stamp out football violence. Stadiums were redesigned to keep rival fans away from each other and off the pitch. We went through an era when the solution that people proposed in many parts of the world was to say, well, if we have a problem with people causing violence, they'd shut them away in pens so that we can control them. High fences appeared at many grounds, some topped with razor wire. Fans hated them. That's nothing to do with safety. That was a way of saying, you are a potential problem, we're going to cage you in. Fencing was a crude design solution to a complex social problem and led directly to the worst stadium disaster in Western European history. The Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, England, was chosen as a neutral ground for a big competition match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest on the 15th of April, 1989. 
the stadium featured a typical anti-hooligan design. High fences divided the terraces up into pens and protected the pitch from possible invasion. But well before the three o'clock kickoff, the central pens at Liverpool's end of the ground were becoming dangerously overcrowded. In these two pens, people were just absolutely jammed together. By the 20 to three, it was already twice the safe safety certificate number. One of the people caught in the crush was 17-year-old Gary Burns. You just assume that then somebody would say, well, all right, that pen's full, shut it off. And then it started getting more uncomfortable. And then you suddenly realised that you couldn't move. You were pinned to one position. If you hear a woman screaming like you, you think, well, someone's going to come and help in a moment, because there were people obviously in distress, there were people shouting out for help, but there was no one there. Unaware of the problems inside, other fans were still trying to get into the overcrowded terraces. But because only a tiny number of entrances had been allocated for 10,000 ticket holders, a dangerous crush had formed outside as well. The guy outside radio in and said, I'm, I'm seriously worried about injuries, possibly even worse than that out here. The, it, it, there's no way we're going to get these people into the ground anywhere near the kickoff. Frustration is rising. At five to three, to relieve the bottleneck, police made a fatal mistake. They opened a wide gate that was only supposed to be used for exit. Thousands of fans entered the stadium at once. No one had warned them of the situation inside so they all headed directly to the overcrowded central pens. I want you to think here of a piston going into a chamber which is already full. Inside, people were pushed so tightly together, their lungs became compressed and they began to suffocate. And it's the weirdest feeling, so surreal of being outside in the open air with the sky above you, but you can't breathe. You'd end up gasping for breaths. There were times when you could inhale, but then the pressure would squeeze a bit more and you couldn't actually exhale. I felt in fear of my life. I thought I was going to die. As the game kicked off, thousands of spectators were fighting to stay alive. People immediately started lifting their youngsters to try and get them out of there, and people were grabbing them by the hand and pulling them out. Others were manfully trying to climb this overhanging fence. Others were actually trying to break it down. When they started trying to escape out over the perimeter fence, uh, the police interpreted this as a pitch invasion, as, as hooliganism, and, and started pushing them back. The duty of care which is actually the primary duty of the police in policing events of public nature like this. The duty of care didn't really exist in any realistic sense at all. It was all about these people are trouble. It wasn't just Liverpool, the football fans are trouble. And these are Liverpool fans, that's even worse. Too slowly, the authorities realised people were dying. Bodies everywhere, lifeless bodies. Um, bodies that seemed so limp. People being carried out and put into the grass. 96 people died. More than 400 were injured. What could have led to such extreme overcrowding? The official inquiry blamed poor design, poor planning, poor management and catastrophic crowd control. And yet tragically, Hillsborough was by no means the first stadium crowd crush, or the last. All over the world, chillingly similar disasters have occurred for the same reasons. In 1996, in a Guatemalan stadium, 76 people died at a World Cup qualifying match. Once again, most died from compressive asphyxia, 
the crush stopped their lungs from working. Even at Heysel, suffocation was in fact the cause of most deaths. Although hooligans had triggered the fatal stampede, no one actually died as a direct result of fighting. The mass fatalities, the cause of death has invariably been constrict of asphyxia. That's where you, uh, you can't breathe. You, the, the, the pressure around you is so immense that you, you breathe out, you can't breathe in again. So you suffocate to death. After 30 seconds, you lose consciousness. After six minutes, you're brain dead. Attempting to prevent this horrible form of death has become the life work of Professor Keith Still. He advises everyone from Olympics organizers to the Saudi Arabian government on how to move masses safely. A mathematician by training, he's brought a scientific approach to the problems that occur when individuals turn into a crowd. Above one person per square meter, we start to behave as a crowd. Your options for choice start to become reduced. Your lines of sight become reduced. We can't take whole paces. Everyone seems to know where they're going, so we'll just follow on. It's going with the flow, in effect. At this point, individuals have become powerless to influence the crowd they're in. The whole is bigger than the sum of its parts and more dangerous. Progressive crowd collapse happens when one person falls over. He hits the ground, taking two or three with them, and then you have a wall of people. The mistake for decades was to try to blame people, like hooligans, when crowds were crushed. It's not the crowd's fault. It's a failure to control the flow. It's a failure to understand the dynamics of the crowd in those confined spaces. Assuming that the crowd can be controlled and coerced, rather than designing around the crowd's needs, was the biggest mistake in the past. At Hillsborough, Overcrowding had created a force so great, it broke metal barriers. But such pressure would never be able to build up again, thanks to a change in stadium design, which took place immediately afterwards. The first most visible sign of, of progress after Hillsborough was the perimeter fences started coming down. Sometimes the best engineering solutions are the simplest. Hillsborough had proved that a crowd can't look after itself. It needs to be managed. So engineers had to develop new technology for monitoring and moving people. Some of the most state-of-the-art systems in the world can be found at Anfield, the stadium of Liverpool Football Club, whose fans died in the 1989 disaster. Crucial to the design of any modern arena is something most spectators barely notice, the control room. So this is the hub of all the operation for a match day. Without this, you haven't got a stadium. This nerve center surveys the whole stadium, both visually and electronically. It's designed to make an overcrowding disaster impossible. At every turnstile, when everybody goes in, gives you an electronic pulse. So it can tell you how many people have come through that turnstile, how many people are in each area. And the idea is that's giving you a build-up as to the flows of what's coming in. So you don't end up too many people in one section. And if you did get to that number, bells would go at the turnstiles and automatically you've got to close them. The threat of violence has been eliminated not with fences, but by identifying, arresting and banning any troublemakers. There are 56 cameras throughout the stadium, so you can see numbers, people, movement, crowd dynamics, and any incidents. The 45,000-seater stadium also brings in a team of around 1,200 people to run each match. That's one member of staff for every 38 fans. Perhaps the most significant change to stadiums after Hillsborough was also the most unpopular with fans. At Anfield, it meant losing a feature of their ground that had become legendary. The COP once held 20,000 people, all standing on terracing. If you look at the, the pattern of disasters, of accidents, Bradford apart, they all take place on terracing. 
Standing terraces were regularly the site of everything from mass fainting to broken limbs, as well as deaths. But in the 1990s, all major football stadiums in the UK were forced to replace them with seated areas. Injury levels have fallen very dramatically. You know, if you're in a seat, you, you, you can't sort of rush forward so easily. Um, when somebody scores a goal, you don't get these sort of great pile-ups at the foot of a barrier. And the same policy quickly became the norm across the world. It's compulsory for venues hosting international competition matches. A side effect was that some legendary arenas have seen their capacity slashed. Rio's mighty Maracanã once held just shy of 200,000. That's been halved to 95,000. But when it comes to saving lives, the UK's experience can't be argued with. Not one person has died in a crowd crush since the end of standing terraces there. So it's no surprise that the new Valencia Stadium will be an all-seater. If the 75,000 seats, which will soon be laid on these beams, were laid end to end, they'd stretch for over 35 kilometers. But to be sure to prevent a crowd disaster here, the designers have to ensure people stay in their seats. What happens when the action gets really exciting? Everyone has got to have a good view of it. Otherwise, if they can't see it, they're going to stand up. And if someone in front of you stands up, you have to stand up. Here, as with every stadium, we design every row individually. We actually start from first principles, drawing what we call sight lines from the goal line or the touch line to the eye of each spectator. The designers then work out how much higher each spectator needs to be to see over the head of the person in front. The challenge for us is to make sure that everybody in the stadium has a great view. Good stadium seating ensures a win-win situation. The sports fan knows they can enjoy their game without obstructions. And the authorities know that they're managing a crowd that's much less at risk. Even though human factors are the most immediate danger stadium engineers worry about, the sheer size of these structures also makes them vulnerable to the forces of nature. Valencia's design features an eye-catching curved facade, but that creates a problem. The non-standard shape is not covered by standard regulations for wind loads. So to prove their design would be safe in a storm, a detailed scale model had to be built and placed in a wind tunnel. The fear was that sections of the facade could blow off or gusts could set off destructive vibrations. But the design passed the test. It's strong enough to withstand even a freak storm. Jay Parrish learned to anticipate natural disaster and design accordingly as part of the team who created the most ambitious stadium the world has yet seen. The designers of the Beijing Olympic Stadium feared it could be destroyed by a natural disaster, an earthquake. The devastation witnessed in Sichuan just months before the 2008 Games was a tragic reminder of the power of these seismic forces. Beijing, too, is in an active earthquake zone. If a strong shock strikes the Olympic arena, the lives of up to 91,000 spectators would be at risk. And stadiums present a unique challenge to seismic engineers. Unlike other big buildings, such as office blocks, their size is spread over a vast area. The bird's nest is over a third of a kilometre in length. During a quake, the ground beneath it would probably move differently at each end of the structure, creating a tension that could pull it to pieces. The inside of the stadium, the concrete stands, the concourses, that's been designed as a number of separate sections. So there'll be one here, there'll be another one here. And by doing that, we can allow each of them to move independently if there is an earthquake. The concrete seating bowl of the stadium has been split up into six segments. In between them, the builders have left gaps of up to two centimetres. 
In an earthquake, each of the sections can move individually. But the steel skeleton that gives the bird's nest its nickname couldn't be divided into separate segments. It has to stay as a continuous structure because it's self-supporting. Columns to hold it up inside would have blocked the views for spectators. We had to come up with a way that we could make this behave well in earthquakes. And we did that by making it entirely separate from the rest of the building. Any contact that it might have with the inside of the building is by a flexible joint. By doing this, the whole outside can move quite happily on its own. These flexible joints prevent the more rigid concrete interior tearing the steel skeleton in different directions. Steel is naturally a lighter and more flexible material than concrete. But the designers still had to make sure the component beams wouldn't break during a quake. So the project's seismic engineer decided to pit the structure against forces so great they're off the Richter scale, using a computer simulation. Anything turning from blue to pink was bad news. It indicated a beam or member had broken. So many did break that the structure collapsed. But identifying exactly where this happened taught them how to make the stadium safe. By identifying the members that have been damaged completely without any strength remaining, and those have been damaged severely, we can just strengthen those members that are necessary. When the test was run again on a structure where just the few vulnerable beams had been strengthened, it didn't collapse. As a result of these tests, the real thing should be standing for many centuries to come. The most severe earthquake we have considered in our design is a very rare earthquake event, which happens once every 2,500 years. The bird's nest is just one of a new wave of hugely ambitious, eye-catching stadiums. Competing with it for the world's attention are the likes of the Sapporo Dome in Japan, which can slide its soccer pitch outdoors and swap it for a baseball field. And soon Europe's largest stadium, New Camp in Barcelona, will undergo this radical transformation and grow its capacity to 110,000 spectators. So when Valencia opens its new stadium in 2009, the designers know it must be more than just an arena for sport. It must compete with these other iconic structures and become an instantly recognizable brand for both Valencia's football team and the city. What we're looking for is to create something which is not just a building, we're looking for an icon. It's like a cathedral. It's one of the few buildings that actually has soul. But designers today are only able to concentrate on dazzling forms and guarantee spectators an exciting experience because engineers have worked so hard to solve the dangers that stadiums once presented. 21st century sports stadiums have truly been built from disaster. We are living in one of the great ages of bridge building, with engineers creating higher, longer, and more spectacular structures than ever before. They defy gravity and reach out across great divides. Driving across them, we take them for granted, but when bridges go wrong, the consequences are appalling. It looked like a war. There's people screaming everywhere, blood, cars sinking, people in them and it shakes our faith in the world. I mean, I, I still sometimes am trying to wrap my head around why I'm alive still, because um, I thought I was dead. Now, bridge builders must ensure that these modern marvels don't fall prey to the disasters of the past. They go back to those disasters and examine them forensically, like a detective at a crime scene. Previous mistakes are analyzed and new technologies devised to combat past failures. In short, every major bridge under construction is being built from disaster.
bridges showcase some of the most awe-inspiring engineering on the planet. Engineers can now build bridges of astonishing height, length and beauty, and designers try to outdo each other with the boldness of their creations. But increased ambition means overcoming increased risk. And when they don't get it right, the results are catastrophic. In 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State was ripped apart by the wind. In 1970, a bridge in Australia collapsed during construction, killing 35 workers. In 1980, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida was destroyed by a freighter, plunging traffic into the water. And as recently as 2007, an interstate bridge in Minneapolis suddenly collapsed, claiming 13 lives. Bridges are not supposed to fall, and there's not supposed to be a collapse like this. When bridges collapse, engineers have a gruesome blueprint of what went wrong and learn vital lessons from those failures. This means that new bridges, however bold in design, will be disaster-proof. One of the most ambitious bridges in the world is Stonecutters Bridge, currently under construction in Hong Kong. When completed in 2009, this stunning superbridge will be the second longest bridge of its kind, with a main span of over one kilometre. Stonecutters will span the entrance to the world's busiest container port and will allow cargo to be moved rapidly in and out of mainland China, providing a vital artery for the country's expanding economy. The bridge is also intended to create a monumental addition to Hong Kong's ever-changing skyline. Many cities worldwide are identified by their bridges, such as the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the Tower Bridge in London, Sydney Harbour Bridge. Stonecutters Bridge will achieve similar iconic status when it's completed. But the engineers behind this golden gate of the East have more in their minds than just function and beauty. They also have to build against a whole range of disasters which could befall a bridge of this kind. They have to worry about the complex aerodynamic environment of the surrounding terrain, protect against the corrosive nature of the salty air, prepare for the onslaught of the annual typhoon winds, and plan for the threat of being hit by giant container ships. No one expects a bridge to fail, but when it does, it does so with spectacular and catastrophic consequences. This is Minneapolis in the American Midwest, on the banks of the Mississippi River. On August the 1st, 2007, it became the site of one of the most shocking engineering failures in American history. At 6.05 that evening, Lindsay Peterson was driving home from work across the Interstate 35 West Bridge. I usually took that route. I mean, it was very common for me to take 35. My job is right off of 35, and my home is right off of 35. Lindsay found herself in slow-moving traffic in the middle of the bridge when there was a sudden noise. I actually heard this really distinct sound of metal snapping. And within seconds after that, I was falling. The bridge had given way beneath her. I, I thought that I was going to die as soon as I landed. I thought I would land on the cement or something and it would smash me like a pancake. There was a team of construction workers on the bridge at the time of the collapse. Nothing alerted them to what was about to happen. I was moving a piece of equipment and the bridge started to shake, which it normally does when a heavy semi goes across or whatever, and it shook and then all of a sudden it just fell out from underneath us. Jeff was driving an earth mover when he fell more than 30 meters. I mean, there wasn't really anything you could do or nowhere to go. You couldn't run or do anything. So I bounced off the piece of equipment that I was on and then cartwheeled off into the water. Stage by stage, the bridge was collapsing. The north end of the bridge buckled up 40, 50 feet in the air, slab by slab, like a snake. Um, coming right, right at me. And it just looked like a monster, the way it took cars and it would buckle up and cars would be suspended in the air and then come back down on the bridge. And um, when it got to me, my slab, it lifted me up. And I remember looking out over everybody and then I heard a boom. It was the bridge coming down and then just one, two seconds later, the whole bridge just went down. And I remember screaming out loud, no, 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 and I truly thought that was the day I was going to die. Andy's car fell 15 metres but stayed on the wreckage. Lindsay Peterson's car, however, went straight to the bottom of the Mississippi River with Lindsay still at the wheel. 
I was instantly submerged under the water. The water was there right away. I didn't have even this moment to gasp for one last breath of air to sustain me. Lindsay became disoriented in the murky waters and couldn't find a way out of her car. You know, it was dark and murky and I didn't really know where I was after a while. But um, eventually I, I started to gasp for air. And uh, at that point I was realizing that I was probably getting close to the end of my time down there, like what I could handle. And I hadn't found an escape yet. And so um, I started, you know, I, I gasped for air like four or five times. And at that point, started to kind of change my perspective and try to um, move away from trying to save myself to trying to accept that I was going to die. For three to five seconds, it was the most eerie quiet I've ever, ever heard, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, you, you couldn't hear the wind, you couldn't hear the birds, you could hear absolutely nothing. And I, for a split second, I questioned that I died. And it, thought that didn't hurt and um, then that went away pretty quick. But construction worker Jeff Ringgate managed to swim to a piece of debris. There's people screaming everywhere, blood and cars sinking, people in them and rubble and rebar sticking everywhere. It looked like a, like a war zone. Jeff caught sight of Lindsay and knew he had to act fast. She was in bad shape. She was in the water. Um, me and my buddy Josh pulled her out with a broom handle and she was bleeding and broken back. She was bad shape. I don't know how I got out of my car. It's really a mystery. The only clue that I really have is that my fist is um, filled with scars. It looked like I had punched a window. I don't remember punching a window though. I would think that I would remember having superhuman strength like that. <laughs> Andy Gannon still has nightmares because of what he saw. The vision of the buckling is what I have the hardest um, time forgetting. Um, I just can't believe it happened. I mean, I, I still sometimes am trying to wrap my head around why I'm alive still, because um, I thought I was dead. I don't know, and there's no real explanation as to why I'm alive, so it makes it even harder to um, really come to terms with that. These were the lucky ones. 13 people died and many more suffered serious injuries. The nation was stunned. How could an ordinary interstate bridge suddenly fall out of the sky? The area was cordoned off like a crime scene and investigators combed the wreckage for clues. Even veteran bridge experts were shocked. It was exactly the same reaction that I had when the uh, World Trade Center collapsed. I said, this can't happen. The incident at Minneapolis scandalized America and severely damaged trust in the country's infrastructure. The I-35 bridge was a 40-year-old steel deck truss bridge. There are 465 similar bridges across the USA. How many others could collapse? You can't live in Minneapolis without going over a bridge. It's pretty much inevitable. I just kind of have lost a trust in the world and that's around me and I've quest I started to question you know, especially anything that's man-made or um, where man has a hand in it, it, it really causes me to question because you think people are doing their jobs and following through with things and making sure it's safe and then something so incredibly horrible happens to you and it makes you just wonder. The inquiry into why the bridge failed is still ongoing, but various theories have emerged. One theory points to a possible design failure. The bridge stood on four central piers in the river, and initial inspections have suggested that there might have been an inherent weakness in the plates which held the structure together at these four points. It's believed that the gusset plates were half an inch too thin for the load-bearing needs of the bridge. But it wasn't clear whether the mistake had occurred during the design or construction of the bridge. Professor Ted Galambos has studied the history of the bridge. The bridge was built exactly as it was designed. So uh, the designer specified this thickness for these plates. Why he did this, we will never know because the person who did the design is long gone and dead. So we can only guess. So was it basic human error? Did the designer get his calculations wrong? I think the more likely 
uh, scenario is that the designer thought it was going to be a different strength steel that was going to go into that joint. The bridge was built during the American construction boom of the 1960s, and there was a drive to save money by using lower grade steel. In the I-35 bridge, there was a mix of different steels in the gusset plates. In structural engineering, you have a constant battle between economy and safety. Despite the alleged design fault, the bridge stood for 40 years. So why did it suddenly fail? Over time, metal suffers fatigue cracking through repeated stress. It's been estimated that the I-35 was pounded by 17 million trucks during its lifetime. Exposure to the elements also makes bridges victims of corrosion, which eats away at the metal structure. Minneapolis has the most extreme temperature swings of any city in the United States. In winter, temperatures can plummet to minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. De-icing systems had been in place on the bridge for several years using potentially corrosive chemicals. By contrast, on the day of the collapse, the temperature was a sweltering 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which would cause the metal structure to expand. In addition, the bridge was undergoing repair work and the contractors had equipment and materials on the bridge, adding extra load. I'd been there about three weeks. I was underneath it. It was in bad condition. There were points along the bridge where there was maybe two inch slats where you could see through it and see down to the river. So it just seemed really wrong that you would, I didn't understand how, why you would ever see the river. Like that just seemed wrong to me. If the structure had faulty gusset plates, then wear and tear, extra loading and extreme heat could have tipped it over the edge into sudden and massive failure. Furthermore, some experts pointed out that these problems might have been picked up on if the bridge had been more effectively monitored. Bridge inspector Bart Anderson gave testimony to an interim inquiry. There aren't enough hours in the workday for 77 inspectors statewide to take care of 14,000 bridges the way we should. Although we have a backlog of structurally deficient bridges and an increasing problem with steel fatigue in many bridges, we're lacking the funding that improves the safety of the bridges. Emergency tests have been carried out on the 465 similar bridges across America, which might also be vulnerable to collapse. And the bridge builders of the future will need to learn valuable lessons from what happened on the I-35. And in the era of super bridges, failing to learn these lessons could lead to catastrophe on an altogether different scale. Stonecutters Bridge in Hong Kong is one such super bridge. Its magnificent one kilometre span will be exposed to everything Mother Nature can throw at it. Standing at the gateway to the South China Sea, it will have to tolerate an exceptionally humid and corrosive environment. We are in a marine environment and that brings it with extensive and heavy chloride presence in the atmosphere around the bridge. To fight corrosion, the engineers are using super durable materials. We've put a stainless steel top to the tower. This reduces considerably any maintenance at the top of the tower. The stainless steel skin is of a super high grade and was fabricated in the UK. It'll provide an impermeable layer of resistance to the elements and will never need painting. The concrete used in the bridge is also of a particularly high density to stop chloride penetration. If chloride from salt water gets into the interior of the structure, the steel will corrode and then expand and then crack the concrete. To protect the deck, the inside will be fitted with dehumidifiers to reduce the corrosive atmosphere. For the bridge builders in Hong Kong, the collapse in Minneapolis has sent a strong and clear message. The bridge collapse in Minneapolis highlights the importance of a good maintenance regime for any bridges throughout the world. And maintenance of structures is absolutely vital. For example, here in Hong Kong, Proactive maintenance has resulted in a, an infrastructure which operates very effectively without any issues, for example, with bridge failures. The design of stone cutters includes a variety of innovations for inspecting and maintaining the structure throughout its life. There will be retractable inspection gantries at the top of each of the towers. There will even be a maintenance shuttle train inside the deck to help monitor the interior of the bridge. Stonecutters is bridge building at its leading edge. This international team of world-class engineers is pooling knowledge from all previous bridge failures to create an invincible structure which will stand for 120 years. And it's not just the bridge that needs to be protected from the elements, it's also the staggeringly high approach roads which will bring up trucks from the nearby container base. 
Because Stonecutters is more than just a bridge, it's a vital link in a whole infrastructure chain of roads, tunnels and causeways, and its creators need to make sure that it stays corrosion-free for at least 60 years. Back in America, this kind of innovative approach to durability and safety is now being applied in Minneapolis, where bridge builders are working round the clock to replace the fallen I-35. And the new bridge has to prove itself to a suspicious public. For John Chiglow, it's a tough call. Bridges are not supposed to fall, and there's not supposed to be a collapse like this. And so we, gotta, we have to reestablish that, that trust and confidence that when people use these facilities, they can use it and use it safely. We've been working around the clock since then, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there are no holidays on this job. Incredibly, the plan is to complete the new bridge within a year. The I-35 is a vital road artery running from Texas to the Canadian border, and it needs to be fixed quickly. We've estimated that uh, each day this bridge is out of service, there's a $400,000 a day impact to the traveling public. That, is, that does not include the impacts of the businesses. That, that's what really justified approaching this project in this aggressive of a time frame. To speed up the process, the contractors are using a system known as design-build, in which construction starts before all elements of the design have been finalized. One of the unique elements of this construction is particular parts of the job continuously are going along at the same time as others are being designed. We work at the bottom when we have not yet got what sits on top of it designed and continuing. We work at the piers, whereas we didn't have the design of the deck finalized and all the way along. We know the order we're going to build things, so that was the same order that we had things designed. But the speed with which the new bridge is being built has also raised concerns. Immediately after the collapse of, this, of the previous structure, there was initial concerns when we announced the schedule that we anticipated this bridge being built in regarding safety and how we are going to ensure a high quality structure. And we are not sacrificing quality. Safety is our top priority. Quality comes next. And if you're able to accomplish safe, a safe project high in a high quality manner, schedule will take care of itself. The man responsible for making design decisions during the fast construction process and for ensuring that the bridge is totally safe is Christopher Burgess. This bridge is, is a very stout structure. It's one of the stoutest bridges that I've ever designed and worked on. We are now inside the bridge, directly underneath the roadway deck. You can see here the post-tensioning strand that hold up this span. Each one of these cables right here hold up one million pounds worth of tensional force to compress the span. The new bridge is made out of pre-cast concrete segments known as box girders. And these are held up by a combination of vertical piers and steel cables, which run through the girders, compressing and anchoring the structure. Unlike the old bridge, the new bridge has multiple levels of structural redundancy built into it. In engineering terms, this means that if one or even two elements fail, the bridge will still stand. It's a belt and braces approach to safety. Also inherent in design is a great deal of repetition and redundant features uh, to avoid any potential issues uh, that happened with the older structure. The bridge is in fact two bridges, one northbound, one southbound, with two hollow box girders in each direction. Each box girder is resting on its own pier. Each set of piers is resting in its own foundation. Separate structures, northbound and southbound, are separated by eight feet. With that separation, one doesn't affect the other. There are many, many post-tensioning strand cables embedded in the bridge. If any one particular cable shows distress, it doesn't mean uh, collapse or failure of the structure. So there's many features to make the structure as redundant as possible. In other words, you make as many possible chances for loads to get down to the foundation. Unlike the old bridge, the new I-35 will have no Achilles heel, no single point where it could fail and bring the whole structure crashing down. In addition to all the redundant features, the bridge is also being fitted with state-of-the-art smart bridge monitoring systems, which should give early warning of any problems. This constant feedback of information is a feature of modern bridge design. As bridges perform ever more daring balancing acts, engineers need to know how well they're performing in order to avert possible disaster. This is the tallest bridge in the world, the Mio Viaduct in the south of France. Its tallest tower is almost as high as the Empire State Building. 
Compared to the simple steel structure of the old I-35, this is light years ahead in terms of bridge evolution. The Mayo viaduct is three kilometers long and uses what's known as a cable stay design in which the weight of the bridge deck is distributed by cables across seven towers. At this height and length, the bridge is constantly moving. So there are sensors in the pylons, the deck, the cables and the masts to monitor the movement of the viaduct day and night. Mayo is the ultimate in the new breed of smart bridges, a living, intelligent, self-regulating structure. Both outside and inside, the viaduct is fitted with its own life support system. It's got its own electricity supply and its own water reservoir and fire hydrants. Should a fire break out on the bridge, firefighters won't have to pump low pressure water from the town below. The bridge has its own weather station to warn of incoming storms and high winds. And it has an electronic nervous system, which constantly reports on the health of the bridge. Thierry Vaisad is in charge of ensuring that all the movements and fluctuations of the bridge stay within safe limits. The viaduct that is constructed is terminated. We could believe that it is fixed, but it is far from the case. En fait, il est en permanence en mouvement. Et nous, nous sommes là pour vérifier ces mouvements et vérifier qu'ils vivent correctement. There's so much movement in the bridge's enormous span that the metal road deck can't be permanently anchored to the cliff top. It has to be allowed to slide backwards and forwards over a concrete base. Donc nous nous trouvons dans le tablier du viaduc de Millau. Au-dessus, vous pouvez entendre le trafic. Le tablier, donc le tablier, c'est la partie euh, métallique. Cette partie-là bouge, elle est fixée, elle est posée sur la partie euh, fixe, c'est-à-dire la culée nord, où nous nous trouvons. Quand les températures augmentent, le tablier se dilate, il a tendance à, à augmenter. Quand les températures baissent, il se contracte et il va avoir tendance à repartir. Donc il faut savoir qu'on peut avoir une amplitude maximum de 80 cm, qui est représentée sur cette règle, donc 80 cm, avec 20 cm de marge de part et d'autre, au cas où. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes sur une journée estivale, donc on peut avoir entre 20 et 30 cm de variation sur la journée. The instruments inside the structure have to accommodate the movement of the deck. Le chemin de câble, il est monté sur, une, sur un support flexible qui permet d'absorber justement ces variations. Par ce chemin de câble, passent toutes les alimentations électriques, ce qui nous permet de voir vivre le viaduc au quotidien. Bridge building has come a long way since the days of steel deck truss bridges. Mio has pushed the boundaries of what's possible. At Mio, they actually slid the deck out across the valley because it was considered too dangerous to lift it from the ground. Now that it's finished and has become an iconic symbol of French engineering, nothing can be left to chance. Ici, nous nous trouvons au PC de surveillance du viaduc de Mio. Donc, là, c'est le corps du système. C'est ce qui nous permet de voir l'évolution du viaduc au quotidien. From here, the maintenance team can monitor temperature, wind speed, humidity, and all the stresses and strains imposed on the bridge. Dès qu'il y a un problème, quel qu'il soit sur le viaduc, ça passe au rouge, et il y a un signal sonore qui retentit sur le PC, et l'information arrive en clair au niveau du bandeau des alarmes. Mio is a state-of-the-art bridge monitored against any eventuality, but it can still fall prey to the elements. If the wind gets stronger than 140 km per hour, the bridge has to be closed for safety. In Hong Kong, the engineers at Stonecutters have to build for even stronger winds, typhoons. And wind is one of the biggest threats to bridges, as was witnessed in 1940 when the world's third largest suspension bridge was brought spectacularly crashing down. Bridges are always at the mercy of the elements. They expand and contract with temperature. They are corroded by rainwater and buffeted by wind. And as bridges try to span ever longer distances, the power of the wind becomes ever more lethal. The catastrophic effect of wind on bridges was dramatically demonstrated at Tacoma Narrows in Washington State, USA. Last July, the nation hailed the opening of the new six and a half million dollar Tacoma Narrows Bridge over Puget Sound. When the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was opened on July the 1st, 1940, it was the third longest suspension bridge in the world. It was a majestic example of the fashion for ever more elegant and slender designs. When the bridge started to sway, people thought there was nothing to worry about. And it remained open to traffic, earning the nickname Galloping Gertie. But four months after it opened, high winds slammed into the bridge, setting up a fatal oscillation. As the great roadway, like a pendulum of doom, swayed and twisted in its death agony. 
The bridge then spectacularly collapsed. There it goes. Just moments after it was closed to traffic, incredibly, no one was killed, but the designers of the bridge had clearly made a drastic miscalculation. Suspension bridges in the 1930s had thinner and thinner decks, M mistakes or, or, or misconceptions of ideas will come out. You know, whenever there is something uh, not quite right, it, it, it will come out. And uh, particularly when you have uh, a succession of bridges where you had success, success, then you go a, a little lighter, you go a little lighter, and then bingo, it fails. It was later revealed that this marvel of modern engineering had failed because insufficient attention had been paid to aerodynamics. The solid steel plates on the side of the roadway had offered too much resistance to the wind. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse is not only the most famous bridge disaster in history, but also the most influential. Since the Tacoma disaster, all suspension bridges and cable stay bridges are designed aerodynamically with the aid of wind tunnel tests. Aerodynamics is the study of air movement around objects, and this knowledge grew with the rise of the aviation industry in the 20th century. Nowhere is this knowledge more important than at the massive Stonecutters Bridge, currently under construction in Hong Kong. This landmark $350 million structure will be one of the longest cable stay bridges ever built, and it sits in a particularly complex and challenging aerodynamic environment. Hong Kong is quite hilly, the New Territories to the north, but to the south, it's actually open fetch across the ocean. So we've actually designed this bridge taking into account two uh, wind loadings. One is when the wind is coming from the south during the summer and it's smooth and less turbulence, but also when the wind is coming from the north, the wind is far more turbulent because it's got to come over the hills, as you see, um, to the north there. But most of all, they have to model the bridge to withstand the full force of typhoons, which can reach up to 200 kilometers an hour and bring widespread destruction to the region. At Stonecutters, they had to go back to first principles and test the structure in different laboratories around the world. There were 12 rounds of wind tunnel tests in Australia, Canada, China and Denmark, examining the aerodynamics of the deck, the cables and the towers. The towers at Stonecutters are 300 metres high, as tall as some of the biggest skyscrapers in Hong Kong. Climbing the towers requires two construction elevators and takes around 30 minutes. Because the towers are so tall, they'll be particularly vulnerable to typhoon winds. To help combat this, at the top of each tower, a huge pendulum will be installed, a device known as a tuned mass damper. Uh, later on, we are going to uh, cast a slab uh, and then in install a tuned mass damper at, at this part of the tower in order to stop vibration due to wind. As the tower sways in one direction, the pendulum sways in the opposite direction to stabilize the structure. The main span at Stonecutters will be over one kilometer long. This makes it extremely flexible and vulnerable to the wind. Like most modern bridges, the deck is made of hollow steel box girders. Here, they're shaped like aeroplane wings for extra stability. The span also has a unique twin deck design joined by cross girders with a central air gap. We have a very wide uh, central air gap in this uh, position. Now, this streamlined deck and the central air gap would make the uh, Stonecutter Bridge deck extremely stable against uh, uh, flutter instability, for example. But this central air gap also has a drawback. The drawback is that while the air gap offers structural stability, it can also create a turbulent vortex of air which hits the downwind deck and causes the whole span to vibrate vertically. A similar problem was encountered in Denmark in 1998. This time the bridge was already constructed and started to display dramatic oscillations even in light winds. The design for the Stora Belt Bridge had been tested in wind tunnels, but it was later discovered that at a scale of just 1 to 80, the models were not giving useful information. The problem is that complex aerodynamic phenomena aren't always reproduced in scale model testing, and you can't put the whole bridge into a wind tunnel. Stonecutters learned from the Danish experience and used a much bigger scale model of 1 to 20. The tests showed the likelihood of similar problems with vertical vibration. 
The solution at stonecutters was the same as in Denmark. Guide vanes, or metal strips, were added to funnel the airflow around the near side deck and break the rhythm of the turbulence. We actually modified the, the shape of the deck to make it more aerodynamically uh, favorable. And we in introduced a pair of guide vanes to suppress the vibration problem. These guide vanes should ensure that vertical vibration on the deck at stonecutters will be minimized. Stonecutters will be held up by 224 stay cables, which will also be subject to complex aerodynamic forces. All cable stay bridges produce turbulence because of the way they cut through the air. So the cables also had to be tested in wind tunnels to see how they would perform. Studies have shown that wind and rain combine on the surface of stay cables to create water rivulets which run down the cable and alter the way the cable behaves. And it's not necessarily the strongest gusts or the heaviest downpours which cause most problems. Doris Yao is the stay cable expert at Stonecutters. When there is rain and it is of medium intensity and when the wind is not too strong, the rainwater will form a water rivulet on the upper surface of the cable and the water rivulet actually changes the shape of the stay cables and in the long run it may even lead to a complete failure of the stay cables itself. The cables are made of galvanized steel wires which are protected against the elements by a dual layer of high density polyethylene. It was discovered that a dimpled pattern on the cable's protective skin could counteract the effect of water rivulets by breaking up the flow. We are confident that by installing the dimples on the cable surface, the rain wind induced vibration could be mitigated. One way to make the bridge less vulnerable to the wind would be to shorten the span by building towers in the water. But that would expose the bridge to a whole new kind of risk, being smashed into by any of the giant container ships that pass beneath it. Ship impact is a serious design situation for bridges and there have been a number of collapses of bridges in the past due to, due to ships colliding with bridge piers, particularly in the States. If we were to have a tower in the water, then the chance of the tower being struck during the lifetime of the bridge would be quite high and we'd have to make sure that the tower could withstand that load. Uh, one, one of the most notable was the collapse of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida in 1980. All stations, this is United States Coast Guard, St. Petersburg, Florida. The vessel, some adventure, 606 foot, has hit the Skyway Bridge. In 1980, the southbound span of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida was destroyed when a freighter collided with one of the bridge's piers during a storm. The impact sent over 400 metres of the bridge plummeting into Tampa Bay and caused six cars and a Greyhound bus to fall 50 metres, killing 35 people. Any vessels in Tampa Bay area, Skyway vicinity, proceed and assist. There are reports of people in the water. One man survived the fall when his pickup truck landed on the deck of the Summit Venture before falling into the bay. I seen we shut and I figured it was all over when I couldn't stop. The next thing was I was in the water and I managed to get the door open and I started swimming to the surface and I finally made it up. But I got a lot of water and there was a piece of the bridge there and I held on to that. That tragic event really marked a major turning point in people's understanding of the seriousness and the consequences of ship impact. After that tragic event, a lot of research was engaged in in the 1980s and through into the 90s, particularly in the US but worldwide, to gain a better understanding of ship impact, both in terms of the way that shipping behaves and the probability of collisions occurring, and also then the consequences of that collision, the, the dynamics of the ship bridge impact. Positioned at the entrance to the world's busiest container port, stone cutters will be very vulnerable to ship impact. Towers in the water were therefore ruled out. Instead, the designers proposed to support the bridge from the quayside, but they needed to be sure this would be safe. Matt's team studied the movement of traffic in the Kwai Chung container port and carried out a statistical analysis of the likelihood of a ship colliding with the key wall. We found that the chance of that was maybe one in 300 years, which is too frequent for us to accept without some further study. Further tests were carried out to model the effect of a ship impact on the foundations of the towers. Such an impact would drive a giant bulb of pressure through the soil, right into the base of the structure. 
The impact scenario that we investigated was a 155,000 deadweight tonne vessel travelling at six knots. That's equivalent to the largest container vessel in the world, travelling at about the same speed as the ship behind us is travelling. So the team at Stonecutters added extra reinforcement to the top of the foundation piles to give them enough strength to resist that pressure bulb during ship impact. So we can say with confidence that should one of these uh, super container ships collide with the key wall, then Stonecutters Bridge would stay standing. But it's not ships or wind or corrosion which is the biggest destroyer of bridges. The most hazardous time for a bridge is when it's being built. In 1970, the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne collapsed during construction, killing 35 workers. It fell from a height of 150 feet. According to eyewitnesses, the section of the bridge broke its back along a central seam. There was virtually no warning for the men working inside. The tragedy occurred when two box girders were being connected. The box girders were out of alignment by four and a half inches, and an attempt was made to force one of the girders into position using 80 tons of concrete blocks. When the blocks were removed, the whole span snapped. The construction of any bridge is always a risky business. Engineers are working with heavy loads at great height, and there's always a battle against the elements and the law of gravity. At stone cutters, there's the extra hazard of working over a busy shipping lane. Kuaicheng Container Terminal is one of the busiest container ports in the world and one of the key safety issues for us has been ensuring that we can erect the deck of stone cutters over the navigation channel without endangering either the shipping or the workers themselves. The cargo traffic coming in and out of Hong Kong is too important to stop while construction is going on. So during the lift of sections of the deck, a safe working zone is set up 200 metres by 200 metres which is patrolled by security boats. The deck sections are constructed in China and delivered to the site by barge. A new 300-ton section is lifted into place by two giant lifting frames every two weeks. Uh, that means uh, 845 we can move out the barge, is that correct? In charge of the lift is operations manager, Patrick Chan. Coordinating from above is Englishman, Nigel Day. OK, you all set? Two 300-tonne cranes lower their clamps into place. The barge has to be stabilised in the water using GPS-controlled motors at each corner. If it were to drift into the shipping lanes, the results would be catastrophic. OK, uh, Jackie, what pressure have you got? Each step of the process is coordinated with great care and concern for safety. Stop, take some stop. Any problems, and the process is halted. On, and let me low. Then we low down the spider beam. The barge also has to be completely static, so that when the bridge section starts to lift, it doesn't twist on the cables. As they're lifted, the deck sections sag and distort under their own weight. What this means is that at the end of the 30-minute lift, the box girders have to be bent back into shape to fit the rest of the deck. OK, what's the gun to OK? I'm going to start pulling in two minutes. Once the deck section is level, it's pulled towards the rest of the bridge. The outer edge girders are then forced back into shape using an external post-tensioning system, shaped like a set of goal posts and fitted with four 500-tonne hydraulic jacks. Potentially, it's a similar situation to Westgate in Melbourne, where the bending of box girders caused a fatal collapse of the structure. OK, boys. After three. Yat. Yi. Sam. Paul.
The difference at stonecutters is that every stage has been modelled by computer and there's close monitoring of the shifting geometries of the structure and the stresses being imposed on it throughout the operation. The bridge builders have learnt from the mistakes of the past and make it look easy. When you've done that, have a break. Lunch time, OK? okay. So we're going to take a lunch. Yeah. OK, good okay. job. Good job, yep. Nonetheless, when the bridge is only half built, it seems to hang precariously in thin air. The bridge is not precarious at all. One of the key areas that we considered was when the bridge was cantilevering out over the Rambler Channel. We are focusing very much on the stability uh, and the safety of all workers on the bridge deck at all times during construction. Safety is part of the consciousness of each, each and every worker on the bridge. A lot of instruments are being put in to interrogate the performance of the structure during the construction process. After every lift of every segment and installation of every set of cables, we have analysed the structure. After every lift, the new deck section is threaded with cables and connected to the tar. The cables arrive from the factory on giant rails and are straightened out on the deck before being lifted by a crane up to the stainless steel tar top. They're too heavy to be manipulated by hand, so they're manoeuvred into place by jacks. A matching cable is then attached to the backspan so that the extending deck is perfectly supported. Lessons learned from previous bridge failures during construction mean that Stonecutters is completely stable throughout the process. Step by step, this super bridge reaches out to meet its other half across the channel. Stonecutters will be a state-of-the-art bridge representing the pinnacle of engineering achievement but it's actually just a tiny part of an even more ambitious project. Stonecutters will be just one link in a huge infrastructure chain, which will culminate in a monster 40-kilometer bridge connecting Hong Kong to Macau. When bridges collapse, the images travel around the world and live long in the memory. Shocking bridge failures damage our faith in man-made structures. But bridges are now spanning previously unimaginable distances in ever more ingenious ways. They're crossing oceans and connecting countries. In Hong Kong, there are plans to build a 40 kilometer super bridge to Macau, which will test bridge building to new limits. Construction on this super bridge is scheduled to begin in 2010. It'll be built from a body of knowledge amassed from all previous bridge failures. It'll be designed to be disaster proof. There is increasing ambition in design, but safety is always first. We have to make sure that our bridges are strong enough to withstand all of the design loads. So I don't think that increased ambition is being achieved by reducing the margin of safety. It's more by pushing back the boundaries of imagination. The philosophy at Stonecutters is, if it can be imagined, it can be built, but built safely. In Minneapolis, they've been working round the clock to build a new bridge on Interstate 35 to replace the one which collapsed in 2007. Valuable lessons have been learned, and this time it'll be a much safer bridge, a bridge built from disaster. Obviously, the events were very tragic, but I think bridges are becoming more safe. We know a lot more about bridge behavior than we did 75 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, I think we're applying these technologies now, uh, like the health monitoring system or the redundant aspects. We're aware of these things, and all these new bridges now incorporate this new technology. Up to 600 workers have been employed in the new bridge at any one time, including one of the survivors of the 2007 collapse. That's what I do, so I, you know, I worked on the new bridge for six months and back doing repair, working on bridges. But not all of Jeff's colleagues have regained their nerve. Some of them are still not back to work yet. And well, they are all, all busted up and injured, but some of them, I don't know if they'll ever come back. My buddy Josh, he won't work on bridges anymore. He's doing buildings now, so. The eyes of the world are on the new I-35 bridge, and it has to be seen to be super safe. For that reason, the designers have been extra cautious. Even though the bridge has been designed to carry seven lanes of traffic in each direction, it'll only be striped for five. I mean, not only have we built it very quickly, we've built it with more quality oversight, probably by a factor of 10, than I have ever seen on a job. 
In the early hours of the 18th of September 2008, the new I-35 bridge across the Mississippi River opened to traffic an incredible three months ahead of schedule. The bridge builders have used state-of-the-art smart bridge systems to ensure that a repeat of the previous year's collapse never happens again. Well, there's thousands and thousands of bridges across the, the nation and, and across the world, and people have to have confidence when they use that public infrastructure that they're going to be safe when they do it. It's been estimated that the USA needs to spend $1.6 trillion on its infrastructure in the coming years. Minneapolis has been a wake-up call. In Hong Kong, the ambition to build futuristic infrastructure is balanced by an understanding of the need to constantly maintain it. Building infrastructure is only a part of the story, and only a small part of the story of that. It's very, very important that authorities actually continue to maintain and operate in good condition this infrastructure to make sure it develops its full potential. The bigger story is that in the age of super bridges, it's no longer enough to create a magnificent structure. You have to be equally inventive to protect it from disaster. It may be impossible to design a bridge that can withstand every threat, but as massive spans link communities all around the globe, the lessons of past mistakes are being learnt and are helping shape the future. Skyscrapers, the titans of city architecture for more than 100 years. From New York's Empire State Building to the incredible Patronus Towers in Kuala Lumpur, skyscrapers dominate urban landscapes across the world. There seems to be no limit to our appetite for super tall buildings and no boundary to the aspirations of the people who create them. Within such high and crowded structures, the consequences when things go wrong can be catastrophic. But from such terrible events comes knowledge. And with knowledge, the opportunity to improve, ship, refine. Today, every major skyscraper under construction across the world is literally built from disaster. Skyscrapers define the modern age of construction, transforming our cities and the way we live. No other design so readily accommodates the voracious need for space in our urban centres. But there can be a high price for this particular solution to overcrowded city life. Mexico, 1985. The Pino Suarez Towers collapsed in an earthquake. In London in 1968, part of Ronan Point tower block came crashing down. In 2005, the Torrey Windsor skyscraper in Madrid was devastated by fire. And on September the 11th, 2001, the world was changed when New York's World Trade Center was destroyed. Two and a half thousand people died. Earthquake, structural collapse, fire, blast. The four main threats to skyscraper integrity. Threats that the designers of every new skyscraper must strive to combat using strategic planning, radical design, and pioneering technology. One of the very newest skyscrapers under construction is the Federation Tower in the heart of Moscow. Its designers believe that when finished, it'll be the strongest and safest super skyscraper ever built. The chief engineer of this Russian revolution is American Brad Marmsden. This super high-rise structural steel building hasn't been part of Russia's construction history. I mean, some things just couldn't be done here when we started crying. Upon completion, the Federation Tower will be the tallest building in Europe at a dizzying 365 metres. 
for Russia at least it's, it's a unique. It's, it's height, it's uh, technology. We try to do something that was never done before. With no history of skyscrapers in Russia, the Fed's backers have brought in expertise from around the world, employing construction experts from 20 different countries. As you see on this project, we've got Chinese contractor, China State. When I built this project, Tower West, we had Turkish contractor. Different cultures, different mentalities. When I came to Moscow, I spent the first year, it's like a professor of construction in the Middle East, this is old news. Here, this is leading edge technology. They're working 24 seven here at level 56 to complete in record time for 2010. Each story is going up in just five days. Russia's dream skyscraper is intended to set a new world standard in strength and safety, avoiding the pitfalls of the past. Early one morning in East London in May 1968, a small gas explosion high up in a tower block was to have huge consequences. I started walking down Bridgeland Road, and as I stepped off the pavement, the ground shook. But almost instantaneously, there was a loud boom overhead that made me duck. People have been coming in their thousands to stand in the streets nearby and stare upwards disbelievingly at this great wounded slab of concrete and glass. What caused people to gaze in disbelief was the astonishing disintegration of one of Britain's most popular housing developments, fallen victim to sudden and profound structural collapse. A sight like that you'll never ever forget. I don't think you could ever forget anything like that. It's that, it's that clear in my mind because it was such a shocking sight. You don't expect a structure of that magnitude the fall the way it did. The reasons behind the collapse of this London tower block were equally shocking. When Ronan Point collapsed in East London in May 1968, both the authorities and the public were mystified. Ronan Point had been built to a radical construction design known as the large panel system introduced from Scandinavia, where pre-cast concrete panels were used for multi-story homes. Initially designed for buildings of five stories or less, in Britain, the system was for the first time employed to erect taller buildings. A comparatively minor incident had sparked the chain of events that blew the name Ronan Point into the architectural history books. One of the occupants lit the gas stove in her flat to make a cup of tea. Um, there had been a leak in the gas system overnight and it ignited the gas in the room and caused a big local explosion inside her flat. This local explosion blew a panel clean out of the tower, but the damage did not stop there. It was like a very loud crackling noise and then sections started to fall in on top of itself. Outer sections was folding down, folding down and just ripping off. Others was falling down onto floors below. The, the weight of it was giving way and that was flopping down. It just fell like a, a house of cards. What Ray Hollands was witnessing was a phenomenon described by architects as progressive collapse. Progressive collapse happens when the failure of a small part of a structure leads to the whole building tumbling down on itself. In this case, the gas explosion blew out just one prefabricated wall panel, but it led to the entire destruction of the tower's southeast corner. This progressive collapse at Ronan Point killed four people and injured more than 17 of the 260 residents. Immediately afterwards, investigators began to search for the causes of the disaster. Why should this happen in 1968, in the middle of the 20th century, when we knew we had well over 100 years' experience of building? Investigators needed to find out how a relatively small internal explosion could cause such sudden and total progressive collapse of the entire corner of this multi-storey building. There must be something wrong with the construction 
something has been left out. It's either been left out in the design, in the construction, or in the workmanship, putting it all together. It turned out to be all three. Investigating engineers found that the structure of Ronan Point relied mainly on gravity, downward pressure, to hold everything together. A force or load going upwards or sideways, as happened when the gas ignited, had simply not been considered. Investigators also found that poor construction in the joints meant the blowout resistance of the whole wall panels was less than that of an ordinary pane of glass in a window. This here is the dry pack, which is supposed to transmit the load from the panel above to the panel below. This should have gone over the full width of the joint, but as you see here, at best, it is only over the inner half. How many joints have you found in this state? All of the joints have been in this state. I mean, one of the surprising things is that not a single joint that we've so far exposed has been properly constructed. The failures exposed at Ronan Point caused a public outcry and led to the introduction of new and much more rigorous building standards. It changed the rules and regulations that we had to work to, and it still is a big influence today, 40 years on from when it first happened. The new codes required all new buildings to be able to resist an explosive force of at least five pounds per square inch. Tests showed Ronan Point could only resist a blast of 1.8 pounds. As an alternative method of design, any key element of the structure had to be capable of being removed without causing collapse. This was to be achieved by providing alternative load paths. Engineers wanted to make sure they didn't collapse, and in particular that a relatively small accident affecting just a small part of a building didn't act as the trigger to a complete collapse. Across Britain, many tower blocks built using the large panel system were demolished, and no new ones were ever built using this method again. New skyscrapers were being built, but now they incorporated the lessons of Ronan Point. The first major skyscraper to be built in London after the Ronan Point disaster was Tower 42, completed in 1980. At 183 metres high, it would remain Britain's tallest skyscraper for 10 years. Tower 42 is an in situ reinforced concrete building. The structure is monolithic. It's like a, like a tree. It's very, very strong. To give alternative load paths, Tower 42's engineers designed strong and continuous connections linked by a robust central core. The tower is specifically designed to resist progressive collapse. The connections here between the, the beams and the columns have continuity. That means that you can transfer load through them vertically or horizontally. The, the beams don't just rest on the columns, they are joined up together so that you can transfer load through them. So that if something happens, if an unusual load or a very large load occurs, this building doesn't come apart at the joints. In 1993, this resistance was well and truly put to the test. A large bomb exploded in London's financial heartland and wreaked havoc, destroying a number of buildings and causing more than £1 billion worth of damage. But amidst the chaos and debris, Tower 42 stood tall. This skyscraper's design to resist progressive collapse saved it from disaster. This building really didn't get damaged at all by a, by a quite serious bomb blast quite close to it. 20 years after Tower 42, more lessons from Ronan Point were applied in the engineering of London's iconic Swiss rebuilding, affectionately known as the Gherkin. Here, engineers addressed the issue of alternative load paths by introducing a unique steel structure around the outside of the building called a diagrid. The main feature of the structure is this diagonal arrangement of columns around the perimeter, which we call the diagrid. 
And the structural design is essentially to create a symmetrical, triangulated framework of steel elements, which creates a balanced and robust perimeter. That structure, as well as taking all the gravity, the weight of the building, it also provides the stability against wind loads. The diagonal grid of the pattern on the structure on the outside face isn't just there to produce um, an interesting shape or for people to look at. It is the structure, a series of interlocking uh, steel pieces that cross over, carry the load, and they form a tube around the outside of the building, and that is a really strong way to make a tall building stand up. The Gherkin uses an engineering system called redundancy. This is the duplication of critical components to provide backup or fail-safe, ensuring the safety and reliability of the building as a whole. The Gherkin spreads the load outwards, shifting its weight away from any damage caused in the event of a disaster. Its engineers believe its structural ability to resist progressive collapse is second to none. That is, until this skyscraper is complete. Moscow's Federation Tower, due for completion in 2010, employs not just one alternative load-bearing system to prevent progressive collapse, it has three. It's a kind of belt and braces approach which gives what engineers call redundancy, alternative load paths for the load to be carried back to the ground. The first load-bearing system is a central concrete core, similar to that used in Tower 42. The way the building works is in the middle of the building, you've got the trapezoidal concrete core, which is sort of like a tree trunk that centralizes the whole building and holds the middle part of the building together and holds it up. The core stabilizes the tower from the center. The second load-bearing system uses a perimeter frame like the gherkin. But here it is made up of 26 concrete columns reinforced with steel bars, called rebar on each story, linked by beams to resist side loading. To make sure that we have vertical continuity in the columns is instead of splicing the bars with an overlap splice, we're actually threading the ends of the bars and screwing on mechanical couplers, creating a very tight, very solid tensile connection for the rebar. So it's almost like this rebar all the way down to the, to the ground is a, is a continuous steel tension rod running through the vertical column. The vertical columns are securely connected to the concrete floor slabs at every level. On top of that, we've got some really nicely tied up and closely spaced stirrups that are running across all the slab rebar. So what that does is it makes the joint between the slab and the column very strong and very stiff and very resilient. And the Federation Tower has a third system to spread the load and thereby prevent progressive collapse. Positioned at four levels throughout the building are outriggers, a system of reinforced crisscross concrete beams which reach out from the central core to the perimeter, linking the whole structure together. The outrigger is spanning out to the perimeter and it runs into the belt truss here. So this truss, this these diagonals are making up what's called the belt truss. They span all the way around the building, and the outrigger is spanning into this. It hits down on this. The load spreads out through diagonals and into all the columns, all the perimeter columns. So in the case of a, of a catastrophic emergency, if one of these columns happened to be cut off or removed or something during the life of the building, the columns below could hang themselves up through the steel inside the column to this belt truss, and the load could span back through the belt truss either to more columns or even into the outrigger and into the core. With these three systems in place, the Federation Tower promises to be one of the strongest and most stable skyscrapers the world has ever seen. And its strength doesn't just lie above ground, it's incorporated into its very foundations. The Federation Tower is anchored to the ground with 14,000 cubic metres of high-strength concrete pours non-stop over four days to create a massive anchoring slab. What's more, the pouring took place in the midst of the harsh Moscow winter. During the early months of this project, we were pouring in minus 38 degrees. That meant that we had to have cocoon 
situation to keep the concrete warm. The concrete pumps had to be cocooned. The concrete lines had to be traced. But inside the cocoon, we were achieving plus 12. The foundations have been piled down through two layers of rock, filling any voids with concrete. They had a huge crew of people in here with concrete just coming around the clock pouring, and it was they keep it wet through additives in the concrete that help it set a little bit slower than normal concrete. They're vibrating it with vibrators all around to make sure the concrete flows freely throughout the whole course of the pour. And what that did was it allowed us to have a very nice, stiff and solid foundation mat to sit on top of all these piles. Engineered to resist forces exerted from above, from the side and from below, and with its strength reinforced by foundations 20 meters deep, the Fed is a building capable of withstanding almost anything, even its builders believe an earthquake. Moscow is not in a seismic zone, but the designers of the Fed are taking no chances. Indeed, engineers have learned a great deal about the construction of skyscrapers from analyzing the impact of earthquakes on tall buildings. The effect of earthquakes on buildings, of course, is one of the few opportunities uh, structural engineers have to test what they've designed virtually to destruction. But it wasn't until the Mexico City earthquake in 1985 that a discovery was made which would revolutionize the design of our tallest buildings. Earthquakes are one of the greatest natural challenges for the architects and structural engineers who design tall buildings. But it's the lessons learnt from earthquake disaster that inform the design and building of skyscrapers all over the world, even in non-seismic areas. In September 1985, Mexico City was struck by a devastating earthquake that measured a staggering 8.1 on the Richter scale. Devastation in the heart of one of the most densely populated urban areas on Earth, 30 hours after the five-minute quake, Mexican authorities... At least 9,000 people were killed, and tens of thousands more were injured. Over 50,000 buildings were destroyed or seriously damaged. More has been learnt about building construction from this quake than any other. The 1985 Mexico City earthquake led us to see that the earthquake really does seek out the weakest detail. One important discovery was the way in which steel multi-storey buildings perform in earthquakes. The steel-built 22-storey three-tower Pino Suarez complex collapsed due to column failure. The columns had been made out of steel plates welded together to form a box ship. The earthquake had stressed the side welds of the columns beyond their strength. As a result, the welds were damaged, the steel columns buckled under the load, and the buildings collapsed. The way pieces of steel are connected is vital to maintain what engineers call ductility, or how far they can stretch before they fracture. Ductility is a measure of uh, how much an element can stretch beyond the point it actually reaches its maximum strength. Steel constructions can be especially vulnerable at the point of a weld. Weld metal is intrinsically uh, less ductile than uh, the parent steel material. And uh, if the welded connection isn't uh, a lot stronger than the member that it is connecting to, then it will tend to fail. It's a lesson being taken to heart 7,000 miles away in Turkey's biggest city, Istanbul. This is a high seismic zone, and it's only recently that skyscraper development has been allowed here. Upon completion, the diamond of Istanbul will be Turkey's tallest skyscraper, 270 meters high. Like the Federation Tower, the diamond has a strong concrete central core. But joined to the core, there are three towers in the shape of a Y. And controversially, these towers are being built in steel. This is going to be the uh, first steel construction high-rise building in Istanbul. And maybe it will be the highest one uh, in Europe. 
Turkish engineers are using a technique called full penetration welding to make sure their steel columns don't rip apart in an earthquake. The diamond is using specially commissioned 12 meter lengths of Luxembourg steel for its columns. These are positioned one on top of the other, then skillfully joined together with a full penetration weld, as distinct from the side welds used in Mexico. With experts predicting a major earthquake in the next 30 years, there's no room for error. Burada, uh, birbirlerine eklenmesini yani bu kaynakları gördüğünüz gibi full penetrasyonlu dediğimiz tam nüfus etli bir kaynakla eklenmesini görüyorsunuz. Bu şekilde bir bağlantıyla artık biz bu kolonu alttaki ve üstteki kolonu monolitik bir eleman gibi tek yek fare bir eleman gibi düşünebiliriz. Bu kaynakların kontrolleri röntgenlerde yapılmakta ve kaynakların kalitesi sağlanmaktadır. Unusually this building has got connections between the columns made with full strength, full penetration, but welds between the columns done on the site. Now, that's pretty unusual, even today, to carry out full strength, full penetration, but welding on site. It's very often carried out in a workshop, in a factory situation where the, the, condi the conditions are easier to do the work, it's a controlled environment. It's less easy to do on a site, and it has been considered to be um, difficult in the past, but people are beginning to adopt site welding more, and the benefits that it brings is to provide complete continuity uh, at the junctions in the columns, so that they, in effect, uh, run through as just one member, right from the bottom to the top of the building. The columns are then attached to beams using a specially designed bolt and plate system known as slip critical jointing. 128 bolts, each one tightened to a tension of 35 tons, connect the beam to the column. The plates sandwiching the beam act like huge washers, providing friction and ensuring that the connection is stronger than the beam itself. The main purpose of the slip critical connections is to reduce movement in working conditions. That is, there should be no movement because it's a frictional connection. The key features of, of an earthquake resistant building are attention to detail at the connections, making them ductile and able to absorb energy. And actually, it's the same requirement that prevents progressive collapse of buildings anyway. So the features that have been uh, introduced into earthquake-resistant buildings are actually finding their way into tall buildings generally. Both full penetration welding and slip-critical jointing were born out of disasters resulting from previous earthquakes. Now, all across the world, buildings are using these methods. But there was another, more surprising lesson learnt from the Mexico City earthquake. It was discovered that when the earth shakes, very tall buildings often remain standing, while their lower level neighbours collapse. The seven-floor Regis Hotel, one of the oldest low-rise multi-storey buildings in Mexico, was totally destroyed in the 1985 quake. In this block stood the Regis Hotel, where at 7.20 that morning, the first of 400 guests had been sitting down to breakfast. As both wings collapsed, all but a few perished. And we also heard from the, the Regis, the facade, the, the front started to fall off, and uh, there was panic uh, everywhere. But while many comparable, smaller, multi-storey buildings fell down, some of the tallest buildings in Mexico City stayed up, undamaged. Torre Latino Americano, at 182 meters, and the Pemex Tower, even taller at 211 meters, were both unscathed. Contrary to what people might imagine, many of the tallest buildings survived completely intact, whereas some of the 
mid-height buildings and indeed some of the low-rise buildings fully collapsed. And this focused attention on something called the natural frequency of a building. Natural frequency is the rate which a building vibrates in response to an earthquake. The Torre Latino Americano and Pemex Tower fared well because they were so tall that their rate of sway was much slower than that of the shaking ground, so they didn't resonate with the ground motions. Their natural frequency was outside the range of the seismic tremors. Engineers now believe that skyscrapers are actually safer in seismic zones than lower multi-storey buildings. That's certainly what the designers of this skyscraper hope. At 225 metres high, the Torre Mayor in Mexico City is Latin America's tallest building. Completed in 2003, it's designed to withstand a mammoth 8.5 earthquake on the Richter scale. Its engineers have enhanced the effect of its natural frequency with technology developed from the US military, dampers. These are like giant car shock absorbers. The main purpose of a damper is to absorb energy, absorb vibrational energy um, as a building sways, whether it be in wind or in earthquake. And basically they provide resistance to movement. That is, if there's a fast movement, they pr produce a lot of force. If there's very slow movement, they provide very little force. Each damper in the Torre Mayor exerts well over a million pounds of force. They were designed to allow the skyscraper to safely absorb a substantial amount of seismic energy, which might otherwise have caused damage or even collapse of the structure. In Taiwan, also a high seismic zone, Taipei 101 is one of the world's tallest super skyscrapers at 509 meters. The damper system designed here, called a tuned mass damper, acts like a huge pendulum to counteract the sway of the super tall building, which occurs during earthquakes, and gives the building structural stability. At the Federation Tower in Moscow, the damper's principle is used to give stability to the super tall panoramic central spire, which will be a staggering 509 meters high when completed. Built into the design of the spire here is a few levels of tuned mass dampers, which are basically relatively large masses hung from a, hung from a certain length to create a pendulum. And then at the, at the bottom of this mass, where the actual ball of steel is, it'll be driving piston dampers to dissipate energy. So as the wind is blowing and the mass tries to vibrate, it's building up energy within itself through this resonance. So to sort of damp out the resonance and damp out the energy, we have the mass swinging at the same period as the spire, driving these dampers, dissipating energy, and allowing the spire itself to not go into this aerodynamically unstable range of motion. Disasters caused by earthquakes and structural weakness teach architects and builders important lessons in the design of super tall buildings. but it took a totally different kind of disaster to change their approach entirely. The attack on the World Trade Center in 2001, with its devastating loss of life, received more media coverage than any disaster in history. As well as transforming the political landscape, it also changed some of the fundamental principles of skyscraper construction. led people to think much more about performance-based design and actually questioning and challenging what is right and what is wrong in a building, what is safe in respect to this building. I think it's that change in attitude that's certainly been evident from the post-9-11 era that, that, that's probably its biggest legacy. When the Twin Towers were topped out in 1973, they were the tallest skyscrapers in the world, breaking new ground with their radical all-steel tube construction. However, with 9-11, the weaknesses of the design and materials would be fatally exposed. One of the first lessons learnt was that steel structures can be lethal when subject to intense heat. The tower's steel frames were designed without any masonry or concrete cores. Without these, it had very little effective fire protection. 
with an open plan layout, the fire had total freedom to spread rapidly. The steel beams failed from the intense heat, and without the support provided by these beams, the columns began to buckle. Like Ronan Point, the towers had only one load-bearing path, and with no alternative, the steels could not support the weight of floors above, collapsing onto them. An initial cave-in triggered a disastrous progressive collapse. But even before the towers collapsed, another fatal flaw in modern skyscraper construction was exposed. With their mechanical and electrical systems unprotected against fire and impact, the elevators in the Twin Towers were rendered unusable, and the stairs proved tragically inadequate for evacuation and rescue. Seven years on, work is progressing on rebuilding the World Trade Center site. The first skyscraper to be built at ground zero since 9-11 is Seven World Trade Center. These were the footprints of the original Twin Towers, which are being designed and constructed in the new World Trade Center Memorial. Tower 1, the Freedom Tower, and Towers 2, 3, and 4 are modeled here. And we are in Seven World Trade Center, which is located right here. Seven World Trade Center is a symbol of America's resilience and determination to rebuild and assert itself as a world leader in skyscraper construction. We learned on 9-11 about the reliability, the importance of reliability and redundancy of systems. With an emphasis on safety, engineers here are surpassing New York's already stringent building codes. We had to reinvent the codes to deliver the strongest building ever built. At Seven World Trade Center, engineers have continued using steel, but crucially, they're employing an advanced protective coating to safeguard it from fire. Now, this building fireproofing system, unlike most common fireproofing systems, is cementitious in nature. It has a cement content to it. And it also has a much greater adhesion to the steel and a cohesion within itself. And it's, as you can see, it's, it doesn't compress. So it's much stronger than common fireproofing. And the intention is to provide protection to the structure. It's very important that the fireproofing remain on the steel under emergency circumstances. When Madrid's Torre Windsor skyscraper was gutted by fire in 2005, the steel structure, some of which had a similar fire-resistant coating, remained standing in spite of the intense heat and the fire blazing for a full 24 hours. The Torrey Windsor had a reinforced concrete central core able to resist the fire, which saved the skyscraper from collapse. It's the concrete core at Seven World Trade Center with its two-foot-thick walls, which is central to the idea of safety. The center core is like the spinal column, supporting all of the other elements in the body. And this must be protected, as does the spinal column protect the, uh, the nerves within the, uh, the column. And so the reinforced concrete core houses and protects the essential elements of the building. The designers behind Seven World Trade Center are determined that never again should people be trapped in a damaged tower with no means of getting out. What you have to create is a building in what you can get out all the people that the, they are working on the building in a safe way to get them out, and then the building to have the minimal amount of damages. Here, the essential escape routes of elevators and staircases are engineered within the reinforced core to protect them from failure and provide a protected passage for people to evacuate quickly and safely. They exceed even the tough new building regulations introduced in New York post 9-11. The stairs are one foot wider than required by code. And the reason for that is that we wanted the ability for people to be able to walk down one side and someone else to walk down the other. So two people to walk side by side. The code requirements had the stairs much tighter than that and did not enable people to walk side by side or for there to be a counterflow of traffic. Some people going down the stair, perhaps emergency responders coming in the opposite direction. 
With wide landings acting as refuge areas, people who can't evacuate immediately can wait, free of further danger, for the rescue services. The Corps also provides protection for the fire suppression system to mitigate against an interruption to the water supply in the event of a disaster. Not only are they protected, but we have redundancy. We have one in each of the two stairs, and the sprinklers are hooked up to both of them. So in the event of a failure in this particular riser, there's never more than one floor without sprinkler protection. As a direct result of the events of 9-11, engineers at Seven World Trade Center have rewritten safety standards that are now being adopted and surpassed all over the world. Since 9-11, engineers are using every technique at their disposal to future-proof their skyscrapers against disaster. In Moscow, those behind the new Federation Tower are determined that its design and construction will enable it to withstand any threat from any quarter. Nobody ever thought that airplanes would crash into a building. Nobody ever tried to think about what happened if all of the building's columns were simultaneously impacted, removing all the fireproofing that was on them, and then melted by an incredibly hot fire. At the Fed, a state-of-the-art blast-proof facade envelops the building from top to bottom. The fact that it is uh, consisting of a laminated light, laminated glass is two lights of glass with a sandwich layer in between. Uh, it's a PVB or polyvinyl butyl layer sandwiched in between two lights of glass applied by heat and pressure. That sandwich layer of glass allows it to be structural in nature to span a taller uh, distance than usual, in this case four meters, and also to react to uh, large and small missile impacts. Small missile impacts and large missile impacts, the laminated units, uh, glass units on the building, are designed to, to absorb the impact of those missiles, but also to not become disengaged from the, the metal framing that holds them on the building. Сделано техническое задание, было сказать, сделано предположение, что башня должна быть недосягаема для воздушных атак. Для этого конструировалось таким образом, чтобы выбивание как минимум одной колонны, соответственно, путем попадания любого летательного аппарата, никоим образом цельность башни не нарушала. В этих же, в этом же контексте мы предположили, что в ближайшее время высотное здание и безопасность, как два слова, должны стать словами синонимами. And the strongest card in the Fed's safety hand? Concrete. But no ordinary concrete. Specially designed super strength grade 90 concrete. Capable of withstanding a terrifying impact of up to 1,200 kilonewtons. The formula and the, the final concrete is extremely strong. Uh, and that's why to, to produce it, we uh, built a special factory. We use special laboratories who control that uh, the technology. We train uh, the contractor to work with this concrete. It's extremely important and it's extremely fine-tuned job. The steel encased inside this concrete will not suffer the same fate as the twin towers, one of which came down within 56 minutes of the fire catching hold. A central core with one meter thick walls of this super strength concrete will provide ultimate strength against impact, as well as superb fire protection. They're high strength concrete, they're very thick. They're sort of like a, like a sink for heat. And if you have such a huge volume of concrete where there's a fire next to it, it's better than having a very small volume of concrete. So the concrete would raise in temperature very slowly because it takes such a long time to elevate the temperature of concrete, uh, of this much concrete. This fortress in the sky is designed to be fire resistant for four hours at a blistering 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the Federation Tower is aiming to rewrite the rule books on emergency evacuation. 
whereas once it was don't use in the event of an emergency, a revolutionary twin elevator system encased within the fireproof core runs two carriages per shaft. These are designed to be used in an emergency and ensure people can evacuate quickly and safely. 9-11 changed uh, the thinking in, uh, in the elevator business, how to bring the people safe down uh, and evacuate them, not to make the people nervous and not to say you have to take the steps. No, you can take the elevator. The stairs are also housed within the reinforced core to provide a clear escape route, free from fire and debris. The access to these stairwells is protected by a drencher system, which acts as a water curtain. Предназначен для того, чтобы задержать данные прикновения огня или дыма в данные путь эвакуации. And for those who can't escape immediately, there are refuge areas located on the outrigger floors to protect them until help arrives. The idea of the refuge floor is to give a few floors throughout the building, throughout the height of the building, that people can go and, and wait for the fire department to get them. So the fire department can actually use a couple of very well-protected elevators to come to these floors and bring them back down. Whereas in the World Trade Center, the firefighters were running up the stairs all the way up 100 floors of stairs to try to rescue, you know, as many people as they could. And as well, you can see, this is a great place to put it because it's very structurally sound and just very safe. All skyscraper designers now aim to create buildings that remain strong and stable under any condition, capable of resisting earthquake, fire, blast, or structural collapse. Some aspire even further, taking on what is arguably the most difficult challenge, how to overcome finite energy reserves in the creation and maintenance of super tall buildings. Super tall buildings have the advantage of being above everything else around it, so they, they have greater exposure to, to solar radiation that can be converted into power. But they also have a, a, a density that allows you to employ technologies that would not otherwise be uh, cost effective if the building was more distributed and, and you didn't have that density of space. With wind turbines, solar energy, and a unique water-cooled air conditioning system, the architects of the Pearl River Tower in China, due for completion in 2010, aim to make it among the most energy-efficient super-tall buildings in the world. We look at how buildings can reduce their reliance on the city's electrical grid. We look to reduce the amount of water that they consume. We also look to take energy that is inside the buildings and recapture that energy and reuse it over and over again. In Dubai, the proposed 322-meter-high Burj Al Taqa skyscraper would be entirely energy self-sufficient. Power would come from a 60-meter wind turbine on the tower's roof, from hydrogen extracted from seawater, and from 15,000 square meters of solar panels. In what would be a unique engineering feat, in Moscow and Dubai, there are plans for rotating towers entirely powered by giant wind turbines situated between each of 78 separately rotating floors. Engineering ambition knows no bounds. The Burj Dubai is the world's first mega high rise. Already at 700 meters, it is the world's tallest structure on completion in September 2009, it will be nearly one kilometer high. Large man-made structures uh, help to define civilizations. Uh, the Egyptians had pyramids. We have our super tall buildings. Uh, the, these buildings will last long beyond us. They will be what we leave behind.